say a few words about Elvis. Now, the theme of this video is like Elvis as a tragic hero. Now, when I was in school, they defined a tragic hero, the Greek definition, as a man <clears throat> of noble character whose actions produce the opposite of his intentions, resulting in a catharsis, a moment of pity and fear, in which the protagonist realizes this. Um, Elvis really does embody the whole the whole idea of the American dream, the whole idea of the meritocracy. He was a poor white trash kid. Uh, his father got arrested for writing a bad check at the grocery store. His mother was a cleaning lady and a seamstress, and he came from grinding poverty. And he went on to become, arguably, the most uh, beloved entertainer of modern times, like, really. Um, he, he was a uh, he literally went from rags to riches, and he accomplished it entirely through talent, which was all the traits of success that have been always pretty much worshipped as the ideal of what the American self-made man. Elvis kind of embodies the American self-made man. He really does. He's a self-created man. His hairstyle, his brave rocker attitude, his clothes, his uh, pink jackets, his sideburns. Um, his androgyny, his moves, his singing style. None of this shit was concocted by uh, Hollywood. None of it was following a trend. Um, he, it was, it was, he used, borrowed a lot of it from black music and from country, but nobody had ever done anything like this before. It was sort of like Eddie Van Halen or Muhammad Ali. He was, he was just a genius. He was, and he did it when he was 19, 20 years old. You know, most people don't know anything. I didn't know how to wipe my ass when I was 20 years old. <clears throat> this guy was already Elvis at 20 years old. And uh, you got to remember, he was a hillbilly, and he was named Elvis. I mean, t um, another thing, another reason I think Elvis does qualify as a tragic hero is because of his longevity. Um and his, his ability to adapt to a lot of changes, changes in the music industry, changes in the historic times. Um, and there were many potential points, points of failure in his career in which he could have gone to a certain point and not made it any further. Um, when he got signed to RCA for the highest fee that had ever been paid to a new artist, which was like $35,000, $40,000, he had to deliver for RCA I and mean, they expected him. He'd been making hits for Sun Records and, you know, they were, he'd been billed as this guy who could make a lot of hits and RCA wanted him to make a hit and they gave him Chet Atkins as, as a producer and flew him out to New York and uh, he had to deliver. He had to make a hit record and he did Heartbreak Hotel and the, the studio brass, when they heard, I mean, the people at RCA, when they first heard Heartbreak Hotel, they didn't like it. They thought it was a song about a guy about to commit suicide. They thought it was too much of a downer. And uh, it didn't do very well at first. It was kind of sluggish on its way up the charts. What if he'd flopped on his first record? And But fortunately, he had, he had he was, and this is where the luck comes in, he had Colonel Parker, who, despite his flaws as a human being, and as a manager, in many ways, um, he did he did uh, predict the the importance of television before a lot of other people, a lot of other promoters, and he saw that it was a visual medium with a potential for a mass audience, and he thought he knew that it was going to be the next big thing, and he got Elvis a gig on a spot on the Tommy Dorsey show. And he did well with that. And you got to remember, this was this was the beginning of live television. It wasn't the production values weren't that great. It was all black and white. Uh, you know, everything was live. You know, if you screwed up, it was live. So you know, when Elvis got up in front of those cameras, he had to he had to bring it on. He had to bring it across. That was you know something that was going to come across on a black and white TV. And he did it. You know, and the girls all screamed. And well, he did do good on the. Tommy Dorsey show. He got on Steve Allen. He got on Milton Burrow, and he uh, 
You know, he, he, he dealt with some adversity on those shows. He got through Ed Sullivan. Um, and, you know, he could have choked on any of these gigs. If, if one of them had not gone well, then that could have, that could have derailed everything. But it was largely on the, on the, on the, uh, strength of those television appearances, those early television appearances that the Heartbreak Hotel went on to become the big hit that it did. And if it hadn't been for TV, it might have just languished. So there's that. And uh, it's easy to forget that Elvis, it, it took big balls to do what he did. He had to produce an aura of self-confidence and ease. And uh, you lose sight of this because he's, he's such a generally comes off as such a humble, self-effacing, humorous, genuinely nice guy. But beneath the yes sir and the yes ma'am and all that, I think he was, he was a tiger. He was, he was, uh, he could bring it when it came to performing. Um, it takes a lot of belief. It takes a lot of, uh, it's, it almost must be a Muhammad Ali. You have to be able to hypnotize yourself into having that much belief in yourself to be able to, to bring it off that, with such conviction, it took big balls, and uh, so and he also had endurance. Elvis made it through three decades. He made it to the fifties, the sixties, most of the seventies. Um, that's a long time to be a, a superstar at the highest level like he was, um, and he could absorb punishment. He could go on. He had endurance. He 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 played a schedule that would put most performers today under the table nobody works like that anymore like the way Elvis worked in the 70s they they killed him he was on the road 160 dates a year sometimes twice a day <clears throat> it was grueling and you know there were just many points of decision what if he choked during Frank Sinatra specials when he got out of the army when he went to the army like he thought it might all be over he was sure it was he thought when he got out of the army that everybody's going to forget about him and rock and roll kind of went into decline after Elvis went in the army cuz a lot of other stuff happened uh there was that plane crash where Buddy Holly got killed and but Richie Valens and Big Bopper and a bunch of other people so that took some of the star power out of, you know, that was a whole class of rock stars. That, that, and then there was Jerry Lee Lewis married his cousin and got blacklisted from American radio and had to pretty much go play in Europe to make a living. Um, Little Richard converted to Christianity or something and quit playing devil music, quit playing rock and roll, so he was out. And uh, a lot of the, you know, white... It was kind of Pat Boone and this sort of bleached kind of how much is that doggy in the window? In the early 60s, there was kind of a fallow period when there was a lot of uh, <clears throat> a lot of lightweight stuff. And then in the 60s, Elvis's movie career petered out. And, uh, and you know, those movies were very stressful for him. He, he did 29... 30 pictures over nine years and during that time he starred in every one of those things and when you're the star of the movie man you're under a lot of pressure you're in every scene every you know you got to know all the lines you got to hit all the marks he had to sing all the songs he had to do all the publicity photos and go to the recording sessions and it was it was it was some grueling doing three of those movies a year he would go film and then he would take little breaks and then go back. I mean, he was, he was working. He was working pretty hard. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have the idea that Elvis was such a great performer and he was so confident that, you know, you can't imagine that a guy like Elvis would ever get nervous, but I've heard, heard him in interviews and I guess according to his bodyguards, he did. He got stage fright like everybody else. I mean, he used to say, like, I, I get nervous every show and he goes like, you know, people would say, like, well, how is that possible? Like, you know, you're Elvis. You go out there and everybody drops dead. Like, how can you how can you have stage fright? And he was like, well, you never know, man. Every time you get out in front of a different audience, it's like a different vibe. You don't know what's going to happen. It's like you might do your best stuff and there might nobody will clap. There'll be crickets. 
I mean, he definitely uh, appreciated, some rock stars have a disdain for their audience, but that's one of the good things about Elvis is he really appreciated his fan base and he, he realized that all of his, of his success was because of them and he, he was very patient with signing autographs and talking to fans and uh, he used to spend a lot of time outside the gates of Graceland, you know, shaking hands with people and signing autographs and hanging out with them. Um, you know, he could have choked at his first Vegas gig. I mean, talking about some pressure. He was playing. He was playing to a, for a lot of money. This the colonel negotiated this big contract, and a lot of the brass who were paying for it, they weren't sure if Elvis was going to be able to cut it. That he was the kind of, you know, they thought of him as an old '50s guy. Uh, you know, who had been a movie star for a while, and was he going to be able to compete in this world of, you know, modern rock? And it's, uh, you know, when Elvis Elvis started touring in the, in about 1970 when he did his first road shows. I mean, you have to remember how early this was in the history of uh, rock touring. Really, uh, at that time, the only big acts like selling out hockey stadiums, like in the modern, super touring super group sense for people like Jimi Hendrix, you know, there was only a handful of people who were able to do that. And Elvis was one of the first per- people to do it. Um, he had kind of a, during the early 70s, he had kind of a friendly rivalry with Led Zeppelin, you know, about, who, you know, because there were very few people who could sell out 20,000 seat hockey arenas at that time. And you know, he, used to look, he used to go out and look up into the audience and he'd say, I might not be Led Zeppelin, but I can still pack them in, and uh, apparently they met. They met at one point. <clears throat> There's a big story about it. It's on YouTube. No sense going into it here. But anyway, my point is, uh, uh, on his way to becoming a legend, Elvis had to pass many tests, and he was tested. He had to fight uh, the army. That wasn't, you know, he his career was on the way up, like, and he was at the peak of his fame, and the army drafted him, and he went in the army and for two years and he didn't know what was going to happen when he got out he he thought it was over like he really he was kind of bummed out he he thought my god oh, i'm going to go back and nobody's going to remember me i'm going to be driving a truck and it's all going to it's all going to blow away and he lost his mother uh then he got involved in hollywood and the, the colonel got him roped into all these movie contracts because he had to keep the money going because he had by that time he had uh, his whole family was being supported by him, you know, like they had like 30 people that were dependent on him. He became the men- money machine in this, in this system. You know, the colonel was making all his money off of him. He wanted to keep him going. And then there was the drug addiction, and he carried that cross and went on with it for, you know, he went through all the stages, but he he basically handled his drugs for the most part and uh, you know you have to remember even at the end even when he was all fat and fucked up he was still out there he could still bring it even when he was fucked up he could still sing you know sometimes he might have been stumbling around and forgetting the words but there were times when he would dig deep and pull it out like you know like you see at the end of the Elvis movie and uh he died in the harness you know he didn't uh he didn't quit and end up laying around his house like Brian Wilson, and you know he he stayed on the road and died in the harness, died on the way to another tour. So anyway, my name is Rob Rob Hauser. I'm co-author of the book, the How About a Date book, which we're going to rewrite and change the title because it wasn't that well thought out when we first did it. I didn't know anything about writing books, and my mom didn't know anything. She just had her story that she wrote down about her dates with Elvis, and she wanted to make it into something, and I tried to help her, but I didn't really know how to do it at that point. Um, So anyway, she went on two dates with Elvis in late 1955, right before he got signed with RCA, so it was kind of an interesting time. It was kind of like a uh, an interesting point on his journey. It was kind of like the last of the the uh, young, naive Elvis of the 50s, you know, Elvis of the pre, pre-fame Elvis before he became a, a national superstar.